The fact that her soul is breaking shows me that things here are not okay. I'm very concerned. I want to bake everyone cookies right now. Hi everyone, welcome to this video. On my channel, I analyze song lyrics very in depth through the lens of literary analysis. Today, we are continuing our journey through Taylor Swift's album, Evermore. I will link the playlist of the folklore songs and Evermore songs I've done so far. Feel free to request which song I should do next. Today, we are analyzing the song, Coney Island. This is probably my favorite song on Evermore. I was under the impression that a lot of people didn't like this song as much, but according to your requests, that's not true. So here we are analyzing the song. As a reminder, music is very subjective. Everyone is gonna have their own take on it. So everything presented in this video is my own personal opinion. I always encourage you all to comment down below what your thoughts are. I think that word choice is very important. For that reason, I tend to concentrate on diction, which is word choice and connotation, which can be thought of as the vibes or the emotions that the words elicit. This song is a duet. It's Taylor Swift featuring Matt from The National. It's about two lovers who are having a rough patch in their relationship. Each person is kind of introspecting and reflecting on how they got to where they are. The song title here is actually a setting. Coney Island is an amusement park located in New York. I think that Coney Island is a location that is very significant for the romantic partners in the song. A lot of times specific places or even specific objects can take on a definition for us and a deeper meaning. I talked about this concept in my analysis of the song Cornelia Street off of Taylor's album Lover, which I will link below if you're interested. In that video, I talked about how Cornelia a street, a street in New York, turned into a physical manifestation for Taylor's love with her romantic partner. This is a similar sort of thing here where a location is taking on a lot of significance due to experiences they had there and emotions they felt there. This also reminds me of the song Somewhere Only We Know by the band Keen that I analyzed. I talked a lot about how going to a particular place that was meaningful to you in your past can potentially help you access who you were during that time and help you kind of reconnect with the older version of you. The two people in this song, they could literally be going to Coney Island to try to access those memories and to kind of ground themselves back into the relationship or this could all just be metaphorical. I really want you guys to pay attention to the themes of cycles and repetition and going in circles like a merry-go-round. I think that's a very big theme in this song and I do not view it as super positive. Positive. With that being said, let's just get started with verse one. This first verse is sung just by Taylor. I will be referring to Taylor as the female protagonist and the male vocal sung by Matt. I will be referring to that as the male protagonist. Protagonist means the main character. Break my soul in two, looking for you, but you're right here. If I can't relate to you anymore, then who am I related to? And if this is the long haul, how do we get here so soon? Did I close my fist around something delicate? Did I shatter you? Break my soul in two looking for you. I have a lot to say about this first line, specifically the phrase break my soul. I touched upon how I think about a soul a little bit in my analysis of the song Ivy by Taylor Swift. To me, the soul is like the very essence of your being. It's like your truest, purest form. I do not view a soul as being breakable. No, I really, really don't. That's why this to me is like the reddest of red flags. A heart, is breakable, right? In a romantic sense or even in just like a platonic sense, a heart can break. You own your heart, but you share your heart in every legitimate relationship you have even in your friendships. Your soul I view as much more personal and your soul is not breakable to me because your soul to me is energy. It's like energy in motion. It's like a cute ball of energy. If you try to break it or to like take it apart, it's kind of like, um slime I guess very cute slime that's very like important and spiritual you know how when you take slime apart it doesn't come apart you still see like thick threads of it that are connecting one another that's how I envision it would be if like your soul is trying to be broken up except instead of slime it's like energy it's like um, a force 
Or I guess you could also think of when you're kneading dough to make bread or pizza and you kind of take the dough apart, you can see really big strings of it still together. The fact that her soul is breaking to me shows me that the depth of things here are not okay. I'm very concerned. I wanna bake everyone cookies right now. Chocolate chip and also pumpkin chocolate chip because I love the fall time even when it's not fall, so. I am a red album stan, not sorry. The fact that the soul is being mentioned here and we know that this is within the context of a romantic relationship is leading me to believe these people are soulmates because your soul is not something that other people readily have access to. You would only share your soul with your soulmate. I think being love and being soulmates are different. I would define soulmates as two people who connect on a deeper level than just being in love. The connection is very deeply, deeply rooted within the most intimate parts of your being and your existence. So that's how I view soulmates. Of course, I place a lot of value on romantic love as well. That's very beautiful and it can be very painful if that gets broken. But I think soulmates having issues and souls breaking in two, it's not just like a romantic sort of pain, it's a human being identity existential sort of pain. So that's why I'm very concerned from this first line. This is a very powerful first line. I am very shook right now. Let's see where this goes. Her lover is more like a stranger to her now. She has to try to find him. The fact that she's searching for him means that a change has occurred. She's trying to find him in an emotional way. This is horrible. You're sitting next to someone and you feel a universe away. That's a lyric later in the song. You feel like you are a universe away from them. You just feel very disconnected. These two lines show us that this is very intense and also there has been a shift in the ability of these two lovers to connect with one another on a deep level. If I can't relate to you anymore, then who am I related to? This female protagonist is experiencing a sort of identity crisis. They really have defined themselves in relation to their soulmate, the male protagonist. Usually I would interpret this as a red flag of codependency. However, since this is like soulmates that we're talking about, I don't view it as a red flag. I just view this as a natural thing. I don't think it's codependency. I just think that when you connect with someone at that level, like you will feel their presence. You know what I mean? You will feel their vibes more intensely as opposed to other people. So I don't think it's a codependency thing. I think it's very much like you're one of my kind. I have like a very like intuitive feeling towards you so I can sense when something is wrong. So I think this is just showing us the state that their relationship is in right now. Everything has shifted. The female protagonist is now questioning who she can be close with, who is she related to. So there is an identity crisis here. That is not fun. That's very sad. And if this is the long haul, how do we get here so soon? She's pretty much saying it's not supposed to be this way. We can assume that they talked about being together for a very long time, perhaps forever. They were in it for the long haul with each other, right? The long haul is like your whole life, but their long haul turned out to be a very short haul and she's surprised. She didn't expect for this to happen, at least not this soon. Did I close my fist around something delicate? Did I shatter you? So she is trying to figure out how she contributed to them getting here. This is the main difference between this song and Exile off of Folklore. Both of those songs are about miscommunication in relationships, but in Exile, there's also introspection, but there's also a little bit of finger pointing. In this song, there's literally no finger pointing at all. Both parties involved, both romantic partners, they keep introspecting and reflecting and they keep trying to figure out the part they played, the hand they played into getting where they are right now with the unstable dynamic of their relationship. I think that's really healthy. They're not blaming anyone. They're just really trying to understand how they got to where they are. They both kind of feel guilty. I think that's very positive. This means that they care, right? They're not trying to like run away from it. Throughout the song, both parties are just trying to sit alone with themselves and understand what is going on. You only put effort into understanding something like this 
if you care. So to me, both parties are still in love. They just don't know how this miscommunication occurred. When she says, did I close my fist around something delicate? She's kind of wondering if she ruined him in a way. Was she too harsh with him perhaps? When it says shatter, that's very heartbreaking. When you break something, it's usually broken up into very few pieces. I've said this before in my videos when I talk about like breaking versus shattering metaphorically, but if you break something, you can get some metaphorical super glue and glue it back together and and put it back at a weird angle and no one will know like it's fine right however if you shatter something that means you're breaking it into many many pieces maybe you won't be able to recover all the pieces right it's gonna be very hard to put it back together the correct way you can't really hide the damage right so shattering someone versus breaking someone shattering is much more intense she's concerned that she ruined this person in a very deep way that's not repairable verse two and i'm sitting on a bench in coney island wondering where did my baby go the fast times the bright lights the merry go sorry for not making you my centerfold i want to talk really briefly about the two main ways that i'm interpreting coney island i think about coney island either as a literal location as a setting or as a mindset this is very similar to how i interpreted the song somewhere only we know by the band keen i'll link it below if you're interested if we are to think about coney island as a literal location as a setting when it says i'm sitting on a bench in coney island we can interpret this as the female protagonist literally getting in her car or going on the train or subway or cab i don't know how does new york work let me know sometimes when you want to remember something you go to that physical location it's going to bring back memories there's an energy to being in a place physically all of your senses are involved you may see landmarks like a special tree or like a bench as it's described in this song all of those things can serve as reminders they were once the backdrop for very beautiful memories and they can help trigger those memories memories and really take you back to that particular time. There are so many other things involved when you go to a physical place, like the weather, the angles of the sunlight, birds chirping, the chatter of a crowd, the smell of fried food. You can store a lot of memories in those extraneous random things, right? You wouldn't necessarily remember them all the time. You might, but if you actually go to that setting, you'll see these things. And they're all little mini catalysts for specific memories. So it's very possible that the protagonists in this song are going back to that setting. Another way to consider Coney Island is as a mindset. So when it says I'm sitting on a bench in Coney Island, the protagonists could just be thinking that. This place, Coney Island, could be synonymous with an internal place, with a mindset or a particular emotion that they have. It's a place that they visit in their memories, and perhaps they're trying to get back to that state of mind when things were better in their relationship. So when it says, I'm sitting on a bench in Coney Island, wondering where did my baby go, she could be anywhere in the world, right? She could be sitting on her bed, but in her mind, she's introspecting. She's trying to get back to her internal state during that time. This interpretation is a little bit more more existential in my opinion. I think both of these interpretations work. What I will say is Coney Island seems like a place or a mindset or just a symbol that grounds this relationship. It's like the cornerstone of their relationship. It kind of keeps them stable. I'd be really interested to hear your take on this. Please share it with me in the comments below. This is still the female protagonist, by the way. For me, I think she literally is going to that place. I think a lot of times when you want answers about something, you go to a place that reminds you of what you're thinking about it can really help ground you I imagine that they as a couple define Coney Island in a very positive way I imagine them having lots of dates there having lots of cute memories there notice she's sitting there alone right ideally both parties would be in that location metaphorical or not so there's really like a separation a divide between both of these lovers right now she's wondering where did my baby go the fast times the bright lights the merry go Okay, this is really interesting. I really enjoy this. Fast times. So fast times can be thought of as exciting times. In one definition I read, it says fast times can be like risky. The phrase fast times can be defined as a period of time characterized by quickly paced activity, especially involving extravagant or risky conduct or other exciting events. This phrase was popularized by the novel and 80s movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High. 
high. It's described as a coming of age comedy drama. I've heard of it a lot, I just personally haven't seen it. If you had a MySpace in 2008, you will recognize this phrase from the album by The Academy Is called Fast Times at Barrington High. I'm assuming this title was inspired by Fast Times at Ridgemont High. If you're in the mood to feel like an angsty teenager, I would recommend the first and second track on this album, About a Girl and Summer Hair Equals Forever Young. I still listen to those pretty often. The diction here, the phrase fast times is interesting because it seems exciting. There's some passion involved. There's a feeling of freedom that I associate with this phrase. It just feels like a very fun and spontaneous night out. However, it's not balanced and I wouldn't say it's sustainable. I would associate this phrase with maybe the beginnings of a relationship where the feelings are the most fresh. However, if you are associating the phrase fast times with a relationship in the long term, it's not positive. The thing is, you wouldn't necessarily want the phrase fast times to be associated with the entirety of your relationship. You might want little sprinkles of it, but if you're in the state of quote fast times for too long, you're gonna get tired, right? Every single ride in an amusement park, they're not that long. It's only fun to go fast and to go like upside down through waterfalls for a short period of time. You will get sick if you are in those fast paced rides for too long. So this phrase is interesting. I think it's positive to feel it every now and then as long as you have a strong and stable foundation underneath, right? Have your fast times on stable ground. But if this feeling exists in excess, then that would definitely be a foreshadow of instability to come. Bright lights. Light imagery is usually very positive. I talk about sunlight imagery in my lyric analysis of the song Daylight by Taylor Swift. It's going to be linked below. Light usually is very illuminating. It can be very cleansing and it can provide a lot of clarity, right? It can let you see things that would be hidden in the darkness, reveal truths for you and reveal like paths to go down, etc. It can be like very illuminating. Bright lights mean that it's like extra bright. That's very positive. I am interpreting this as the bright lights of an amusement park at nighttime. So it's like a light, a brightness in the dark, which is very positive. However, I'm gonna bring in my own bias here for a second. For me, I really think that like nature imagery is the most poignant and the most significant, the act of a flower growing. We can't really control it that much as humans. We can't control when the sun rises and when it sets. We can't control the moon cycles. So that's why I place a lot of significance on nature. So for me, sunlight is the most positive type of light present. I don't necessarily think bright lights are the most positive. The lights here, they're man-made, so there could be errors. A light bulb could go out, a light bulb could break, there could be a power outage. There's less like stability with that imagery in my opinion, and more stability with sunlight imagery. I think this is a little bit significant, and you know, I understand that there is like a bit of an extended metaphor here of amusement park imagery, so I understand why bright lights are used. It fits into the context of this song perfectly. However, we have a mention of a sunset later on in this song, so there is like nature doing things with light. I'll explain that more in a second. For me personally, I'm just very biased. I am a nature stan in the context of literary analysis. I do see the bright lights as a bit of a foreshadow because they can be broken. You're just less sure that bright lights will work. If you had to make a bet, of which source of light is more reliable, the sun during the daytime or the bright lights during the nighttime, like you're gonna bet on the sun. Again, this is very much my own personal bias. For me, the bright lights here, it's kind of like a false positive. Something appearing grand and beautiful and promising, but it really being hollow and lacking the amount of value that you thought it had. So to me, this image is a foreshadow, especially because it is following the phrase fast times. It's like a live, fast, die, young sort of vibe. That's what the phrase fast times and the phrase bright lights are indicating. The merry-go. So this is referring to the merry-go-round. This is not a positive image at all in my opinion. Again, the relationship is kind of being aligned with an amusement park and Coney Island in general. If you want to take this image more literally, it's possible they had a cute moment on the merry-go-round. For me though, a merry-go-round is just going in circles. It's repetitive. Like, okay, the concept of infinity, let's discuss that for a second. I'm not like the biggest fan of the concept of infinity. There's no way to break out of the infinity sign, which is the point I understand, but like not being able to break out of a cycle is not healthy in my opinion. When you're going in a circle, what type of circle is it? 
right? Is it a positive loop? Is it a negative loop? If it's a negative loop, that's very sad that you can't get out of it because it's like a merry-go-round. If it's a positive loop, that's great, but sometimes you want to grow. So any sort of circular, repetitive sort of imagery, I personally do not take very positively. I almost always visualize it as a sort of foreshadow. And imagine being on the merry-go-round and it being fun, but you wanting to get off and not being allowed to. At that point, the little horses are gonna look creepy and the music is going to be creepy too. You can only take so much of repetition in your life. It has to be room to grow. So I visualize like paths or straight lines or diagonal lines or squiggly lines. Literally any type of lines or paths I would interpret as more positive. So perhaps the initial fun part of being on a mirror ground has faded and now they're potentially stuck in a loop. That's definitely a possibility. I would really be interested to hear your take on this down below, so please let me know. Sorry for not making you my centerfold. The centerfold is the middle part of a magazine. It's like where the stitching is. So when you open a magazine, you're most likely to open it to the center. That's where like the cover story is. A lot of attention goes there. That's like the most viewed part of a magazine. It's like the main attraction, if you will. The fact that she says she's sorry shows awareness on part of the female protagonist. She's recognizing that she may not have given him the attention he deserves. She put another thing in her centerfold. She focused on other things maybe and not him. Um, so she's recognizing that may have played a role in their current relationship dynamic. Chorus. Over and over, lost again with no surprises, disappointments, close your eyes, and it gets colder and colder when the sun goes down. Over and over, that diction connotes a feeling of repetition, like a merry-go-round. It's like you're going in a circle. When it says lost again with no surprises, I feel like the female protagonist here feels lost internally. When you feel lost, I would assume a surprise would be like a hidden path that you find, an escape route to get to being not lost. However, here there are no surprises. Instead, it's just a continual monotone sort of vibe where you just feel lost. There's no surprise help, no surprise pathway out. That's how I'm personally interpreting that lyric. Disappointments, close your eyes. So there is a feeling of disappointment here. Disappointments is plural. It seems like there's more than one type of problem right now in their relationship. Another thing I want to note, when it says close your eyes, I think that sometimes when you're so mentally tired, of trying to figure something out. External stimuli can be too overwhelming. I believe that would be an instance where you would close your eyes and just be like, I can't handle anything else right now. That to me is like the image I have when I read that lyric. There's so much going on, right? The amusement park lights are a little bit too bright. That merry-go-round music is a little bit too loud. Can't handle this right now. Oh my gosh, no, no, no. That's the sort of vibe I have from reading that. And it gets colder and colder as the sun goes down. It's getting colder and colder like emotionally. When I hear the word cold, I think of isolation. I think of a lack of some sort. Colder is also repeated, right? Repetition signifies significance. So it's like the cold, very cold. It does in fact literally get cold when the sun goes down. That's just how like the transition from day to night works. But metaphorically, a sunset could be representative of an ending of some sort. So is this like a foreshadow to the end of a relationship or is it just the end of the day? Either one could work here, um, but it is signifying an end of some sort. Another way to look at this is that a sunset is going to introduce you to dark imagery. In darkness, you can't really see everything. There's more mystery, perhaps more fear and more anxiety. The second way of interpreting the sunset is the way that I'm kind of more partial towards. But yeah, there is definitely multiple ways to interpret this. Let me know your thoughts down below. Verse three. This is song by Matt, the male protagonist. The question pounds my head. What's a lifetime of achievement if I pushed you to the edge, but you were too polite to leave me? This last half of the verse is like my favorite in this whole song, chef's kiss. And do you miss the rogue who coaxed you into paradise and left you there? Will you forgive my soul when you're too wise to trust me or too old to care? 
beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Before this, we had some introspection on part of the female protagonist. She was concerned about what she did to get to this point. Now we have the same thing, but with the male protagonist. So the question is pounding his head. The word pound, that diction is significant because when you pound on something like a door, it's more intense. If you knock on a door, it's much more refined and contained. But if you're pounding on a door, there's some anxiety behind that action. So he is very concerned right now. Pounding also kind of feels violent. It's something bothersome. Like this question is bothering him. He's wondering what's a lifetime of achievement. He's really questioning what truly matters in life. Um, this suggests that maybe he was more concerned with his achievements in life, maybe work, career achievements or academic achievements. He was more concerned with that instead of being concerned with his relationship. So his priorities maybe weren't what they should have been. If I pushed you to the edge, but you were too polite to leave me. So he's wondering if he pushed her too far. So when you're in a relationship, if you wanna just view it as an image, you're like holding hands and you're being cute and there's like an aura around you and that aura is like your love. However, when someone starts to like deprioritize the relationship, what can happen like imagery wise is that your hand starts to loosen and you start to look over here right lifetime of achievements we have extra shifts at work if it's academic like extra study sessions you're pushing this other person away subconsciously pushing them so much that you're pushing them to the edge pretend you're like living on a metaphorical love cliff or something and you're pushing them to the edge of the cliff you're just like pushing them away if they get too close to the edge they're gonna fall off and you're going to lose your love right that's a way to visualize this lyric if you want for me it means pushing someone to like their wits end a person can only take so much right the male protagonist believes he created like an emotional distance between them and he's wondering this because he doesn't have the answer notice it says but you were too polite to leave me this is an assumption he's making he's like did i did i like push her too far but she's just too nice to say anything about it now we have my favorite lyric in this song comment down below what your favorite lyric is and do you miss the rose who coaxed you into paradise and left you there. Isn't that beautiful? Like, that's exquisite. So when I think of the word rogue, I think of someone going rogue, going off of the normal path or the expected path, I should say. To go rogue is to behave in an independent or uncontrolled way that is not authorized, normal, or expected. So it's like you're being a rebel, you have a metaphorical leather jacket on when you're going rogue, I guess. Here it says, do you miss the rogue? The fact that the word the is in front of rogue makes it like a noun instead of a verb. Going rogue is like a verb. So this makes it more intense and it also makes rogue seem like a force at play, it kind of personifies it in a way, in my opinion. And if you look at the next line, the rogue is personified because it coaxed them into doing something. When you coax something, you're trying to convince it to come forth. You're doing like convincing, right? So this rogue was a force at play in their relationship. I really, really enjoy the personification of the rogue. It's very much like a mystical force at play here. Perhaps they got together in like a very unconventional way or in a very serendipitous way, in a way you wouldn't expect, in like a rebellious way maybe. I think their origin story would be very interesting to hear, but this force at play, like it, it brought them together. Perhaps there were guards up or something and it coaxed those guards down and that's what allowed these two people to connect. It's interesting because he's aware of this, right? He's aware that there was like a mystical, beautiful, mysterious force at play that brought them together. It kind of makes it feel like it was fate. If you are interested about the topic of fate, I discussed that more in depth in my lyric analysis of the song Invisible String off of the album Folklore and also in the music video of the song Willow as well. I wanted to note that both protagonists sing this last part of the verse from where it says, and do you miss the rogue? This signifies that they are both thinking about this. They both recognize that there was a mystical serendipitous force at work. So they're in agreement about that. They both see the value of the relationship. The fact that this seems mystical reminds me of the song Cornelia Street off of Taylor's album Lover. In that song, I talked about how there was mystical diction involved. Another thing that is kind of similar is that there was also personification of the setting. There was a lyric in Cornelia Street where Taylor sings as if the streetlights pointed in an arrowhead leading us home. So that's personification of the setting. The setting seemed alive and they were kind of helping the protagonist in Cornelia Street and her love interest get together. I find it interesting that I get the same mystical vibe. This 
for us at play is a little mischievous and mysterious, but I think it's overall positive because it coaxed them into paradise. Paradise is just reflective of the state of their relationship up to this point. It was very idealistic and beautiful. They're hashtag soulmates, y'all, so what do you expect? And it left them in paradise too, so it left them alone after it got them to this beautiful place. Will you forgive my soul when you're too wise to trust me and too old to care? This part of the verse is still sung by both parties, so it's like they're both sitting in solitude, but they're thinking about the same thing. They both care the same, you know what I mean? It's a level playing field. They're both expecting the other person to not accept their apology right away. They're thinking that their apologies will only potentially be accepted way in the future when the other person is gray and old and when this relationship is only going to be a distant memory. This shows that they both feel very, very guilty. Perhaps they feel like they don't even deserve to be forgiven. It's really significant to me that both parties, both protagonists are singing this because this means that they're both thinking this. They're just not communicating it to one another yet. It's a green flag, a good thing to me that they're both using the word soul. It shows me that they're both at the same level here. There's no weird power dynamic thing. There usually are in the songs I analyze, but here they're both like, yeah, you're my soulmate, you're my soulmate, hashtag yay, we're soulmates. So to me, that's a very positive thing. Their love is like bigger than just two people. Souls trying to find each other. There's something like spiritual going on here. Verse four. Verse 4 is sung by the female protagonist. However, the last line is sung by both parties because we were like the mall before the internet. It was the one place to be, the mischief, the gift wrap suburban dreams. Sorry for not winning you an arcade ring. So if you watch my channel, you may have noticed just casually that I talk about MySpace a lot. I enjoy a good early 2000s rom-com. I'm a Hilary Duff stan, so putting all those together, I am in fact a millennial. Hi, that's me. I am a younger millennial, okay? But I am a millennial nonetheless. A good part of my adolescence was actually spent hanging out in malls. I connect to this verse very deeply. I felt like Taylor was talking to me. She was like, girl, you hung out in malls and this verse is for you. And I'm like, oh my God, thank you, Taylor. Like, I appreciate it. So let me explain to you why I get kind of emo with this verse. I know malls are like dead now and they're not really a thing. It was a completely different vibe. Like when I, back in my day, on Friday nights, after we were done with school, you would go to the mall with your friends and you would go to the Starbucks in the mall. You would get a Frappuccino and you would hold your Frappuccino as an accessory. You would walk the perimeter of this suburban mall. You would just talk. You wouldn't really go into stores that often. You wouldn't really like sit down. You would just keep walking the perimeter of the mall over and over again with your Starbucks accessory and occasionally you would drink from it. Sometimes you would see your crush at the mall and it was terrifying, okay? It was terrifying. You were just like, oh my God. And that was like the highlight of your weekend. And like sometimes when me and my friends were walking the perimeter of the mall, we would see a group of guys from our school. If we thought they were cute, we'd be like, oh my God, look. For context, this was middle school, okay? We obviously did not talk to them. We were just like, oh my God, a very exciting moment in our adolescent lives. So. Yeah, the mall was great. I am very nostalgic about that time in my life. I romanticize that time a lot. So me, someone who romanticizes that time period of my like adolescence, when I saw the specificity of that lyric, I just felt very connected to it. If I'm very emo and I listen to this lyric, I might get like close to crying, but like I'm fine. Like it's okay. I cannot attest to what a mall was before the internet, but when I was in middle school and like early high school, the mall was in fact a very fun place to be. It was lively, like everyone was there, so it was fun. What's being said here is that their relationship had wonderment, it had an innocence, it had a lively quality to it. When people would hang out in malls, you have to remember that was like the most fun thing to do. So you didn't have a feeling like you were missing out. It was a simpler time. Their relationship at one point was like that. It was like more pure. It was more chill. The mischief, the gift wrap, suburban dreams. A lot of malls, most malls in fact, are in suburbs. The phrase suburban dreams, I think, just refers to an ideal that a lot of people had to live in the suburbs a white picket fence and if you are going to the mall you could assume that you were living that idealized lifestyle i'm not saying that i did but i think that a lot of people would 
think that that's what this line is referring to here the fact that it's gift wrapped means that it's like a present so it's something of value i think this just goes with romanticizing that time period where people would go to malls before the internet because that was the only form of entertainment the last line of this verse is sung by both protagonists it says, sorry for not winning you an arcade ring. They're both apologizing, which I think is healthy. They're both kind of realizing the things that they didn't do but should have done. I guess their mall had an arcade, so good for them. When you win someone like a prize from like an arcade or something, it's very cute. It's a romantic gesture in my opinion. Interesting that it's a ring. A ring is a very like romantic piece of jewelry and it's like suggestive in a romantic way like an engagement ring. The fact that they didn't win each other a ring makes me think that they kind of started to neglect the more simple parts of the relationship, like the little things. I want to elaborate a bit more on the phrase arcade ring. Initially, I thought that this was just a cute sort of gesture, like a romantic date sort of vibe that you see in movies, winning someone an arcade ring. And like I mentioned earlier, I initially interpreted this as suggesting that they were forgetting to do little cute things for each other. However, the more I think about it, the more this is kind of an ominous sort of thing it's it's not super positive so let's break this down and please let me know what your thoughts are down below first off arcade ring is a very interesting juxtaposition juxtaposition is when things are set side by side for the purpose of comparison these two words are in contrast to one another they're opposing you know arcade rings do exist however these words are in too much of an opposition for me to ignore this like i mentioned earlier a ring is a relatively romantic piece of jewelry it's suggestive of an engagement and marriage which is something that's like a grown-up thing right getting married is a huge milestone for the people interested in marriage it's something that they think about as they get older it's something that a relationship grows towards it's something that i associate with maturity Maturity. Now when we look at the word arcade, it's more juvenile, relatively, right? It's fast-paced, it's fun, carefree. Now like I mentioned, this image could be cute, right? This could just be showing, oh I'm sorry for not doing cute things for you like I mentioned earlier. Another piece of diction that's kind of bothering me here, I'm not critiquing the songwriting at all, I'm just, it doesn't sit right with me. When it says, sorry for not winning you an arcade ring, the word win, y'all, the word win makes me feel some type of way. Why does this ring that's suggestive of marriage have to be won? Again, I understand that there is like an extended metaphor of amusement parks and games. For me, the word win in the context of marriage, of an engagement ring, is not okay. Like, you wouldn't win someone a ring, you would plan to buy the ring, right? There's like a mismatch of value and effort. When you win something, like a game, it's mostly due to luck, right? If it's sports or something, obviously you train, but an arcade game, it's like a luck of the draw sort of thing. So there's low effort involved and there's low value involved too. And I'm not talking about the price tag, but I'm talking about the emotions and the thought. There is no value in them when you're winning a toy ring, right? However, when you're wanting to buy someone an engagement ring, there's a lot of value and effort put into that decision. It's like a process. I don't feel settled with the diction here, with the phrase, winning an arcade ring it just seems to be too opposing the level of opposition within the diction here is indicative of the state that their relationship was in at that point i do think that at the end of this song their relationship is in a much better place and i'll explain why however at this point in the song their relationship was not in a good place it's low effort and low value and we have repetition of the chorus now we have the bridge The first three lines are sung by the female protagonist. It says, Were you waiting at our old spot in the tree line by the gold clock? Did I leave you hanging every single day? Now we have the male protagonist. Were you standing in the hallway with a big cake? Happy birthday. Did I paint your bluest skies the darkest gray? They both sing a universal way. Now we have the male protagonist. And when I got into the accident, the sight that flashed before me was your face female protagonist, but when I walked up to the podium, I think that I forgot to say your name. The bridge is amazing. 
I love Taylor Swift bridges. I think everyone does. She's our favorite architect. We stand. This bridge is really continuing this dynamic where no one is blaming anyone. They're both showing self-awareness, which I stand. First two lines. Are you waiting at our old spot in the tree line by the gold clock? This could be literal or metaphorical. They could literally have like a cute spot together where they have a lot of hashtag memories, or this could just be more figurative a figurative spot. It's an old spot, so there's history there, right? They would meet up there a lot. It's like their special spot. Maybe it's like a secluded area that they just stumbled onto that only they know about. Cause it's very specific, right? It's in the tree line by the gold clock. Did I leave you hanging every single day? So how I'm interpreting this is the female protagonist is like realizing that perhaps she didn't show up for him in the way she should have. She feels pretty guilty about that. Okay, so I would like to elaborate further on this particular lyric. I have some thoughts I'd like to share with you guys. I do try to provide different avenues of thought so you can come to your own conclusions and see what interpretation you may vibe with the most. So here is an alternate way of thinking about this. Some may say this could be overly analytical and to that I would counter. Analysis is literally the purpose of this channel. So let's take a quick journey and let me know your thoughts down below. Were you waiting at our old spot in the tree line by the gold clock? I just discussed the more literal interpretation. This was their cute spot. They had a lot of memories there. Her not showing up shows that there is a sort of distance between them. There could be an emotional distance or she could just not be showing up to his events or his things that he wants to go to, right? However, the more I thought about this and the more I visualized this, if you live in New York or if you have been to Coney Island, please share your knowledge with us. Y'all, are there like random gold clocks within tree lines there? I googled this and Google was not helpful in my very important endeavors in trying to figure this out. But for me, and again, I haven't been there so I don't know, but for me, it's kind of an interesting image to be somewhere that sounds secluded and elevated within a tree line and there to be like a random gold clock there. I know that there are shopping centers and shopping districts in places that have an aesthetic that is reminiscent of an older time period. But I don't get that vibe here. I don't think that this clock is there for aesthetic purposes. I don't think it's like a pre-planned sort of cute vibe that this area had. To me, it kind of sticks out because we have this greenery and it's nature imagery here, which I take very seriously on this channel. If you know, you know. Man-made clock adjacent to nature. This is a juxtaposition in my opinion. And the more I visualize this, the more I'm like, this is a metaphorical place and this is just straight symbolism. Let's talk about the gold clock. The color gold is ornate it suggests a value and importance the fact that it's a clock means that time here has value and importance i hope the clock is running normally i hope it's not broken or frozen but the fact that it's gold to me makes the clock stand out there's greenery the trees and then a gold clock there is nature and then something man-made nature within itself does not need a clock nature undergoes the necessary cycles of life by itself so it's very much like free of the reins of timekeeping at least the way that humans keep time we have juxtaposition of an entity nature or i should say a force nature that literally doesn't need clocks that is intuitive and has wisdom and can undergo the cycles of life by itself but then we have the man-made concept of time adjacent to it they're in opposition to one another i find that very very interesting and if i think about that too much i may have an existential crisis so let's move on to my next point something that sticks out to me here too is that this location once represented a feeling of togetherness and love but now it is a symbol of loneliness it's like a deserted place pretty much so i'm getting ominous vibes here is this clock kind of counting down the time left in their relationship is it showing the minutes or the hours that she was supposed to be with her partner and show up for him that she didn't the image of the clock here reminds me of someone having like a weird dream where things aren't where they're supposed to be and then you wake up and you're like omg like what was that about and you google it and then you're like omg what that's the vibe I get. I feel like this is a dreamlike place and this clock is standing out. It's just really pointing to the concept of time, how she didn't spend time with him the way she should have. She didn't show up. Those are minutes and seconds that they'll never get back in their relationship. 
I really do think that there are ominous undertones within the symbolism and metaphors in this song, specifically here in this verse and in the verse previous. It really shows how not good of a place their relationship was at before they started to introspect. How I am personally interpreting it right now is that they're supposed to be in this spot, but they're not. The time is ticking now. Do you know what I mean? Before, if they were there, you wouldn't pay attention to the clock. You would pay attention to the people there, to the two lovers, just, you know, giggling, laughing, flirting, being cute, coming up with their couple name, taking quizzes on BuzzFeed, whatever, doing all the cute stuff. You would focus on that. All that is left there is the clock. There's no one there. The clock is ticking within a vibe of isolation. Time is the only thing you cannot get back. It is not a renewable resource. It's being wasted now. The setting is there. The tree line is there. But the lovers here are not using it. Time is ticking by. Where are they? Why didn't she show up? What a waste for soulmates, right? They're wasting time. That's the vibe I get from this. Please let me know your thoughts down below. I do think this is an interesting way to view it. This definitely makes me feel more emo, but I think this song is pretty heavy if you want it to be. Now we have the male protagonist. He's saying, were you standing in the hallway with a big cake? Happy birthday. Did I paint your bluest skies, the darkest gray? There is like two ways or like one and a half ways, I guess, because I reject the first way to interpret this. So when it's talking about the birthday cake, you can kind of think about it as him missing her birthday party, which is giving me the moment I knew dot mp3 vibes from the album Red. Let me know how stoked you are for Red Taylor's version coming out this fall because I think that 10 minute version of All Too Well is on there and I am like, like how, like what are we gonna do? Like how, like how am I gonna interpret that? Should I do like a reaction to it? Like a first time reaction to it? I don't know, let me know. If we like break down what's going on here imagery wise, he's asking, were you standing in the hallway with a big cake? If you're the birthday person, you're not gonna be in a hallway holding the cake. You're usually going to have like someone bring the cake to you and set it down in front of you or just bring it to you and like sing so you can like be like, oh my gosh, it's my birthday and then blow out the candles or like do this now because we don't blow on cakes anymore. However, to me, how I'm interpreting this is that she planned a birthday party for him, but he didn't show up. I'm imagining the female protagonist walking with his cake down the hallway to take his cake to him to wish him a happy birthday, but he's not there to like receive the cake and to like do this to the candles. I think it's worse when you don't show up to your own party, but that's how I'm kind of like forced to interpret it due to the imagery present. I would be interested to hear your take about this though, so please let me know your thoughts down below. Did I paint your blue skies the darkest gray? So blue skies here connote a feeling of happiness, of contentness. Gray skies are stormy and cloudy and emotionally not fun, right? They represent a sadness. They could represent an anger of some sort. He's like, did I make you sad? Did I hurt you? Did I inflict pain on you? This is the sky and it's nature. So to me, this is very intense. He is changing nature here. So he is very intensely hurting her. So he's wondering this too. I appreciate that they're both thinking about the things they did and they're not really holding back. They're really going for it. They're really saying what they did. They're not like beating around the bush, which I respect. They both sing a universe away. They're not just like worlds apart. They're like literally a universe apart, which is very sad because that's a very long way away. It's a lot of light years. I don't know, what is the unit of measurement here? Light years? Let's ask Xenon. When you think about a universe away, you can also think about them being far from each other emotionally. They used to be like perfectly attuned to one another on the same wavelength, but now they're in different universes. Now we have the male protagonist. He says, and when I got into the accident, the sight that flashed before me was your face. When he was in like a life or death scenario, instead of the entirety of his life flashing before his eyes, which is what you would normally expect in that situation, it was just her face. That was kind of an indicator for him. I'm assuming that he still cared about her, had confirmation that that like the love was still there. I'm assuming that could have been a very poignant experience for him and it could have been a catalyst for him to try to figure out what was going on and to try to repair the relationship. Now we have the female protagonist. But when I walked up to the podium, I think that I forgot to say your name. So when you're walking up to a podium, you are in front of a large group of people and you're gonna give a speech, assuming this was like a thank you speech, like thank you for being my friend, etc., for supporting me. She forgot to thank him and he is her significant other. So there definitely was like a distance between these two lovers. And I'm glad they're both just being honest about their hand in all of this. Then we have repetition of verse two and repetition of the chorus, and now we're at the last verse. I love 
this last verse so much. I think it's so smart the way this is set up. These are all repeated lyrics. However, they are in a new order and this new order makes a lot of sense. And the most important thing here is that this last verse is sung by both parties. Before this, when you had one person singing, that was them introspecting and reflecting in private. But the fact that they're both singing all of these lyrics together to me shows that they have had the conversation. It shows me that they both are aware of each other's thoughts and it shows me that they are like back on the same page. It's like a very positive sort of thing. I'm really stoked because I ship them. To me, the fact that the lyrics are in in a like different order. It's kind of like the lyrics and the thoughts specifically are swirling around in the protagonist's heads. They can mean like different things at different times, but they still make sense. It's like that feeling when you are thinking about things that are so important that you wanna like scream it out so everyone can hear it. There's so much intensity in your emotion, but at the same exact time, you wanna just like whisper it silently and keep it to yourself because it's so sacred right it's just a lot it's just a lot of emotions it's like a flux and flow sort of thing let's go ahead and just break it down when the sun goes down the sight that flashed before me was your face when the sun goes down but i think that i forgot to say your name over and over sorry for not making you my making you my making you my center of fold in this verse we have repetition of the phrase when the sun goes down repetition of making you my making you my it kind of feels like echoes of a conversation they finally had together at least in my mind i think that when they sing this all together it's just kind of like them saying that this is not just one person's fault we both did these things it's kind of like they're stuck in that loop of the merry-go-round of these behaviors that are making them grow apart we both didn't make each other a priority, the centerfold. The female protagonist forgot to thank him at her metaphorical podium speech. The male protagonist forgot to prioritize her too, but he saw her when he was in his accident, right? I enjoy this last verse. It makes sense in the order it's in here, but for me, what's more significant is that they both sing it. I'll use two words that Taylor loves, a kaleidoscope or a mosaic of their conversations. This makes me feel like they resolved their issues and that they are back together in a good place now. To sum up, This song gives us, the reader or the listener, the perspectives of two lovers. First, they're both introspecting on how they got to where they are in their relationship and at the end they come together and they have a discussion about it, which is very beautiful. What I really love about this song is that there are misunderstandings and assumptions made, but there is no finger pointing. So there is a very great level of respect here which is what I would expect of soulmates. So hashtag yay, I stan, I ship, all of the things, yes. Great. I think another thing to consider is just how important a setting is in relation to your life experience. You really do think of the relationship in relation to that setting. And that's all I have for this song. Please let me know your thoughts down below. What's your take on this song? What was your favorite lyric? Please make sure to like this video if you enjoyed it. It would help me out a lot. And subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that bell notification button. Thanks so much. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.